he has an actual episode, but you would have to ask him. So when you ever did my screen check, you would have to ask him. Sir, everybody doing good? Yes, sir. Yeah. So let this uh, check your fire up real quick, and we'll just jump right in. So quickly. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of review from Tuesday. Uh, can somebody describe or at least name the uh, two different algorithms that we discussed? Linear search and binary search. Linear search and binary search. Linear search and binary search. Why is it called linear search? What are we doing with the linear search? Because it goes through every element sequentially. So depending upon n elements, at max it's going to do n searches. So it's going to grow linearly with every n plus one element that we add to that list. And what was the other one called? Binary. Binary search. What was significant about binary? What were some of the attributes that we discussed uh, about a binary search? More of the it has to be in order, right? That was a prerequisite. And since it was in order, what were some of the things that we could do to take advantage of it? Cut it in half, right? Chop that list in half for every iteration of our uh, search. So going through this again, just so that way we all have a clear understanding, right? I'm going to create a little container. Seven elements. Okay. So in a linear search, it did not require it to be in order. So I'm just going to randomly throw in some values. Let's look for the value 10. Okay. So we know that we need some mechanics to set up our process, right? We know that we need some mechanics to set up through the process. So we typically have this Boolean value variable that we're going to have called found that will set the false. We need to uh, return the position in which we found that value inside of our container, so we'll set that to negative one initially. And then we need to start from somewhere. And so typically we start at the beginning of the list, right? And for us, in our containers, we know that uh, we always start with a zero with element, okay? And so we know that we want a loop, right? We know that we want a loop to help us iterate through this container. And so initially, uh, to get us into that loop, to start us going through that process, we determined that uh, the index is less than the number of elements, okay? So in this case, what do we have, seven elements? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven elements, right? And the index was set to zero, so is zero less than the number of elements? Okay, so that's true, but this whole expression has to evaluate as true, and found is false, is that true? Yep, so awesome. So that expression evaluated to true, so we're able to move forward, okay? Now, the first thing that we're going to do is test the very first, or rather, we're going to test the element uh, that exists at that index in our list. And what is our index set to at this point? Zero. Zero. Okay, awesome. So is the value in the zeroth <coughs> index equivalent to my search value? No. Awesome. So we increment our index and we continue through the loop. Index is still less than the number of uh, elements, right? And we still have not found it. So awesome. Is the value that contains at that index equivalent to our search value? No. No? Okay. Awesome. So what do we do? Increment. So now we're pointed here, right? Call this index. Continue through. Is this still true? Yes. Is this equivalent? No. Increment or index. 
Is this still true? Yeah? Are they equivalent? No, they're not. So what do we do? Increment or index. Is this still true? Yeah. Are we now equivalent? Yeah. Awesome. So we set, found to true, capture the index where we're at with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So position becomes 4, right? Come back through. Is this still true? Yeah. This. Is that still true? Index is less than, but this is an and. And in order for that whole expression to evaluate as true, what has to be true about that statement? That has to be false. Everything has to be true in order for it to be true, right? But now, found is not false. Found is true. So this no longer expresses as true. We break out of it and return our position. Okay? What happens if we're searching for the value 88? What would have happened? Right, we would have continued through. We would have never found it. We would have never found it and we would have ended up returning negative one. So more than likely we would have some code instead of like our main or some other function that tests the return value of that function and tests to see if it was negative one. If it was negative one, then we know it wasn't found, right? Otherwise, we found the, the index of, of the value in that container. Any questions about our linear search? Everybody's good with linear search. Worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. How many elements am I searching? Uh, okay. So given n elements, I search n times. Best case scenario. One. One. Right? Best case scenario, it was in the very first container. Right? Worst case scenario is at the end or not found. Best case scenario, it was here. And so on the average case, n over 2, right? n over 2, average case. Cool. So let's talk about binary search. What has to be true about a binary search? It has to be in order. It has to be in order. So let me get some values in here that are in order. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we're in order. Okay. So this one is a little bit more complicated, right? We're not going to go linearly. We're not going to search for every element, right? So we know we need to set up our mechanics so that way we can get our loop to function, right? Bless you. Right? We know that we need to set up some variables to help us set up the functionality of the loop that we're going to use to iterate through our container. So a couple of things that we're going to do is, I want another marker, let me see. Awesome. So, let's see. Initially, we're going to set up first to be zero. Last, what is last going to be? And what is n? So n minus 1 is 
Great, last, the last subscript in the array. So no, we're not going to do n minus 1, we're going to do, oh yeah, n minus 1, okay. So 6. Uh, bound is false. And what's our position? Cool, negative 1. Okay, so awesome. Here's the mechanics that we're going to use to help us iterate through our list. Here's a container. We have seven elements inside of our container. It is in ascending order, right? It is a sorted list, a prerequisite to the binary search. So the first thing that we're going to do is test. Is found is not true, and found is not true because it's false, and the first is less than or equal to the last. Well, first is less than or equal to the last, and bound is false. Cool. That whole expression evaluates is true. Now, what we're going to do next is set our middle to halfway between, where am I? Halfway between first and last. So first is 0, so I think we can do 0 plus 6 divided by 2. What is 0 plus 6 divided by 2? So awesome, there's your middle, right? So 0, 1, 2, 3, here's our middle. Awesome. Oh, we need to, find a, we need to declare a search value. Let's... Somebody give me a value. I want to find it this time. 89. 89? Okay. Cool. So we're going to search for 89. So we know this was true. We found the middle. Now, is the value that exists at that index equivalent to our search value? No. No. Okay, it is not equivalent. So is that value in the middle container, in the zero, in that in that element in the middle, is it greater than the desired value? No. So we're going to set first to middle plus one. So here's first, middle plus one. So this becomes four. Okay. Now we go back up. Okay. Now we go back up. Have we found it yet? No. Is first still less than or equal to last? Right? We have not found it yet, and first is still less than or equal to last. So that expression still evaluates as true, so we're inside of our loop now. Now we need to find a new middle, right? What was significant to us finding a new middle? What did that allow us to do to our original container? We made it smaller. We reduced our surface, right? We reduced our search surface. We essentially got rid of half of our list. We knew that the value was greater than this value. So it makes no sense to keep us attached to that side, right? So we got rid of that. Don't even worry about it. Divide and conquer. Chop that list in half and continue moving forward. Right? Cool. So we found our new middle. Um, so we're moving our middle. Middle is now here. Right? Middle is 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Middle is 4. There's our new middle. Does the value at that element equal our desired value? No, I already did that. It is not, they're not equivalent, right? Is that value greater than the desired value? Remember, we're looking for 89. Is that value greater than 89? No, right? So here we are again. 
We're going to set first to middle plus one. What happened here? I, I didn't update something. I didn't update middle. Okay. Alright. So now I need to update middle again. And we're going to set first to. No, I'm sorry. I skipped a step, didn't I? I didn't do this step. Okay, hold on. I needed to update middle. Middle, okay, middle was three. Middle was three. Hold on. I skipped a step. So we're here, we're here. I needed to set, okay, this was our, this is first. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's do first. Okay, so we set our first. Okay, now we need to set middle, which is the halfway between first and last. So here was first, here was last. 4 plus 6 divided by 2. What is that? 5. So middle is now 5. There we go. Sorry about that, guys. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Bam. Middle. Okay. Now, now this is better. Now this is. Now we're back on the right track. So awesome. Found the new middle. Does the value at that index, is it equivalent to our desired value? Cool. So we found it. Set found to true. Set found to true. And then we want position. Or write that down here. Position is our middle. And then we'll return position. Let's just say, let's keep this going, okay? Let's just say now we're searching for 99, all right? But I don't want to start. We're just going to continue, okay? Let's say that we weren't looking for 89. Let's say that we're looking for 99, okay? And so we're in the same process. Is this value equivalent to 99? No. So we still didn't find it, right? Is that val Is my search value is it greater than the desired value? Is this greater than 99? No? Okay. So we go here. First becomes middle plus 1. My middle is 5. Middle plus 1 is 6. So first is now 6. This is now first. Now we need to find the new middle. Six plus six divided by two. What is that? Six. Six. Here's my new middle. Six. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Bam. Is that the value I'm looking for? Is that value greater than? No. So set first to middle plus one. Have I found it yet? No. Is first less than or equal to last? No. We come out of our loop. What about return? Negative one. We didn't find it. Cool. Any questions on binary search? Would you put this in its own function? Yeah, we'll definitely put it in the sum function. We'll definitely put it in the sum function. What about the array itself? Would you put that in the Well, here, let's let's look at one of those examples we were looking at yesterday. That's sort of kind of where I was going to next. So. Right, so
right? So here was an example of our binary search, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna take all this down, okay, guys? We don't, we don't need this anymore, right? I'm just gonna take it all down. Okay. Right, so here we have binary search. Here this prototype, right? The prototype will take an array by constant, and it's going to take two ints, the size of the array and our search key, okay? And so here in main, we're just kind of setting up um, our search, right? So we created an array. We provided it some initial values. I think I chopped this in array, array in half yesterday, huh? Yeah. I think I, I, think I modified this guy. Um, yeah, there was a, there was, we had like 20 something on the last time. That's okay. We can just play with 10 for now. Uh, so, right, so we have our array. We have the variable that's going to hold the results. We're going to have the variable that's going to hold the value I'm looking for. I prompt the user, give me a value. Then I pass that stuff into the binary search, okay? Depending upon the results that I receive from the binary search, either the number doesn't exist or I provide... Uh, some information back to the user that I was able to find them, right? And so, here's that binary search, right? And I added some code in here just to kind of help us walk through that algorithm to kind of see where we are every time, right? I like to do that, right? It helps me understand what's happening inside of my functions, right? A little bit of poor man debugging, right? So, yeah, here's the array. It's in a separate function. It got called from main, right? And truly, I could have had a different function call that function, right? I could have modularized it even more. But we know that sometimes we want to focus in on the problem so that way we don't kind of overwhelm ourselves. But yeah, typically you're going to wrap this stuff inside of a separate function uh, so that way you can have an isolate. Because what's one of the most important things that we've learned about modular programming and DRY? Say again? Keeps your work clean. Keeps your work clean. What else? DRY. Don't Say repeat. again? Don't repeat yourself. Right? And what were you saying? Of the other engine? Yeah, you can make stubs out of it easily, right? Yeah, most definitely. Right? Modular programming helps us do that. But the most important thing is don't repeat yourself. Now we have a function whose explicit purpose is to do a binary search. Bam. We can use this code over and over and over again. We will see, maybe we might see it in this class, uh, for the computer engineers in here, and maybe even the EEs, uh, you'll probably see it in another programming class where we like start creating uh, separate classes and like our programs can get very complicated at, at, at a given point, right? But you know, this is programming 101 essentially. And we try to really just focus on some of the fundamentals in this class. But if you guys, again, I think there might be one or two computer science majors in here, a couple of computer engineering majors. You guys in here will, will, will build on from this. Let's just run this real quick. And so we exhausted the search, right? We exhausted the search. We did not find it. How many times? So if it was a linear search, what was the maximum number of times I would I would search through it? N, given in elements, I'd go in on, on the max. How about for the binary search? What is it on binary search? Yeah, log base two of n. Log base two of n. And what is what when I say log base two, what does that mean? 
Yeah, because it kind of does the inverse of an exponential, right? Normally we talk about log base 10 of some value, right? But in, in computer science stuff, it's always base 2, right? So when we do log base 2 of something, we're really talking about the reverse of 2 to some value, right? How do we get to some value? And I think uh, in this example, n was 10, right? n was 10. So 2 times, uh, so 2 squared is 4, 2 cubed is 8, uh, and then 2 to the 4 is 16, right? But we don't have 16 elements, but we have more than 8 elements, so it kind of just rounded itself to the 14, right? So, yeah, in, right, log base 2 of whatever 10 was, right? And it's some fractional value, right? It's some fractional value. Cool. So everybody good with this? Because we're going to go on from searching to sorting, okay? We're going to go from searching to sorting. And, and as engineers, these are some of the things that are fundamental to some of the stuff that you're going to be doing. Because engineers, especially when you uh, leave academia and go into your first corporate roles, typically you guys are like test engineers. You're validating and verifying data. You're validating and verifying data, right? We might do tests uh, in some simulator for aerodynamics. We might do some tests on some power system. We might do some tests regarding fluid moving through a bore well, right? So a lot of the things you're going to be doing initially involves verifying and validating tests, okay? So you're going to want to be able to sort through and search for data. And given a million data points, are you going to want that in Excel? Are you going to want to bring a million data points into an Excel spreadsheet and try to filter and sort through data? It gets complicated. Believe me, I've seen people try to do it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 So like I said, there's probably something wrong with the sensor. Maybe the sensor is dirty, or maybe it's just not able to. Maybe that test data isn't going to pass through a problem. I have no idea. Right, that's that's a little bit beyond me, beyond to be understanding. But yeah, that's large sets of data files, right? There's probably some sensor that determines some value, it uses that value to engage some apparatus, and that apparatus performs based upon the value that it received, right? That's what sensor data do. Um, Internet of Things, right? Telemetry data, like time series data. Like, um, I think I've said this before, we have those uh, oil fields of, uh, right north of us, right above, uh, right across Panorama, right on the other side of the bluffs. Do you know how much data we collect daily from that field? Gigabytes of data, telemetry data. From downhole on the card, right, to understand the fluid levels at the bottom of the well, to understand the fluid dynamics as it traverses that, that core, the uh, well bore, right, to how much load is on the string as, um, they call it a rod string, it's really not a string, it's like a pipe, it's literally a pipe. But that pipe stretches like 5,000 feet below the ground, right? And uh, given that much stress, it, it does move around on the string, right? But as uh, that string goes up and down, there's a certain load on it. And given that load, we might stress out the motor. Maybe we didn't collaborate, or maybe we didn't configure the motor to perform at that level given that load. Maybe the counterweights become off balance. So think about all of the data that we can collect from one of those devices out in the field. And how many devices do you see in that field? Probably like figuring a thousand devices out in the field, right? And so every minute, well, it's not every minute, to be honest. Probably every 15 minutes, we collect time series data and send that back to some SCADA system. And so some engineer is analyzing that data, trying to find more than likely max values, like, hey, that's a maximum load on my device. I need to figure out why that's occurring, right? Because we look for outliers in the data, right? We look for outliers in the data, right? If there's no fluid on the bottom of that well hole, there's probably minimum load on that rod string. So we look for mins, well, this is the max. We look for max and mins. And we understand 
as engineers what that means to, in that scenario, our production facilities, right? But if we're talking about aerodynamics, um, I think I told you before that I have a friend that works for General Atomics. It's a government contractor out in San Diego. Um, her job was...